good? We're running. So it's a Zoom class, get the information from Barry if you want the link to Zoom with us and uh, it's kind of a video and then there's a discussion around it, so that's kind of cool. Um, Pamela is starting a class at, I think, Mary Harris's house, um, going through the book of Galatians. Should be fun. We're actually going to preach through the book of Galatians starting at the end of January and going through February. So. God really wanted somebody in this church to learn what's in Galatians. So go to the class on Tuesday, get there, and then actually pay attention during the service. Um, okay, Tina's ready to move on, so she went to the next slide. And I'm done talking about Galatians. There's going to be a class at Greg and Judy's house on Saturdays, and I think starting this Saturday, 2.30. They always provide coffee and snacks and so forth. If you're interested in that, they're going to do a face-to-face -face instead of a Zoom. Uh, so if you're interested in that, you can. I think they've left some books, some material here uh, that we can get you, or uh, you can touch base. There's Judy's email on the screen, or just let me or Barry or Tina know, and we can get you whatever information you need. Finally, we're going to start back up serving our community on Thursday, so we're actually going to collect uh, some things. There you go. We're collecting them online. So I'm pulling the bus. That's exciting. So if you would contribute, that would be awesome. Or if you want to come and actually do the work on the ground, that would be cool too. We partner with uh, Sweetwater, I think, for that. So you can see Barry or see Pam if you're interested in helping out with those things. All right, I promise scripture to you. Scripture you shall give. We're going to read Psalm 96 this morning. 
Psalm 96 verse 1 begins this way. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar and all that fills it. Let the field exult and everything in it. Then shall all the trees of the forest sing for joy before the Lord. For he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in faithfulness. Let me open this up with a word of prayer this morning. Father, we will come into your courts and into your sanctuary with praise. And with offerings, offerings of worship, offerings of our hearts. God, as we begin a new year, we pray for your blessings in 2021. But we also pray for your strength. Give us the faith and the hope that should define us as Christians. And Father, I pray, melt away our selfishness. And let us this year be a community. Remind us, Lord, that we are part of a family and part of a community. We can never just act as an individual and base everything on our own self-interest. But remind us, Lord, that we are part of a family and a community. Allow us to behave appropriately in that respect. Father, we are thankful this morning because we come to you free. Free to worship, free to sing, free to gather. But we know, Lord, that there are brothers and sisters in Christ in dozens of countries around the world. In the eastern and western parts of the world, in the northern and the southern hemispheres of the world. Lord, there are Christians who are persecuted by other faiths, who are persecuted by governments. Father, we lift up and pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. We pray for their faith. Lord, give them strength. Protect them from the enemy. God, I pray. Give them peace. Somehow, Lord, let them know that their brothers and sisters in America are praying for them, that we haven't forgotten them, that we love them. God, we earnestly and humbly ask that you bless, protect, watch over, and go with those who are persecuted. Right now, as I pray, I know there are people in prison for their faith. I pray, God, that they know they are not alone. Give them strength in this moment. And Father, as always, we continue to pray, and we want to begin 2021 with this prayer. Open doors for the First Christian Church of Mableton to know our community, and to love our community, and to serve our community, and to evangelize our community. Father, we know you have placed us here. And we know there's a reason for that. Let us love South Cobb like we love ourselves. And give us opportunities, God, to serve and work in this place. To lift people up who are downtrodden. To give hope to the hopeless. To give peace to the anxiety ridden. And to give the word of Jesus Christ through the gospel to all who are lost. God bless our actions as we move to glorify you and make you famous in South Cobb. Today, Lord, focus our hearts on you. As we begin our service, we're going to sing songs of worship to the almighty God of the universe and let our hearts pour out the praise that you deserve. As we study your word, Father, I pray, speak through me. And as we pray to you, Lord, we are thankful that you hear our voices, that you care about our trials, and that you know human suffering 
because you live and abide. God, you are awesome, eternal. In Christ, you are risen and glorified. And this morning, we give you all honor and praise. Jesus, in your name, amen. 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 2021, 2021, let's stand up. Give God some praise. God be the glory this morning, amen.
I'm not going to speak this morning about New Year's resolution. That probably gets a little overdone this time of year. And it brings up bad memories for some of us anyway. I'm not going to speak about New Year's resolutions, but it is pretty obvious that a lot of folks see a new year as a time of renewal. Maybe even a restart. Just wipe it clean, set the clock back, start over. If any, if corporately anybody ever wanted a restart, it's got to be us in 2021, right? If somebody says 2020 was your best year ever, I need to talk to you right after this. Service. We want to restart. Maybe even stronger. Maybe a renewal. Maybe even a stronger. Maybe a redemption is what people need. A chance to restart and be renewed and even be redeemed from the past. Not what the past has done to you, but what you've done to the past. You can't talk about restarts and renewals or redemption without thinking about the event that happened on a cross up on a hill outside the city gates of Jerusalem. In Roman occupied Palestinian territory 2,000 years ago. The ultimate event that turned back the clock, that literally slate clean and gave everybody an opportunity at renewal and a restart and a true redemption. New Year's is great. I didn't see one person crying for 2020 being gone. I saw an awful lot of people celebrating. And instead of hello 2021, which is the typical social media post on the New Year, thousand years ago. It's an odd event. It's an odd event. I think it's fitting. We offer communion every week for those who are interested in partaking. But you know what? Even if we didn't, I would want to have a communion service this morning. Let's start January 2021 prayerfully, consciously, intentionally giving God thanks. Amen. On a glorified creation to come. We are literally a new creation. And we have one person to thank for that. One person. And we pause now to remember that person and remember the price paid to give us that creation. Let me pray. Jesus Christ, as we come to a time of communion, we can't help but think about renewal and redemption. Lord, we know we can mess up our lives Unfortunately, we can mess up other people's lives. We can be scarred. We can scar others so deeply. And then sometimes it seems maybe hope is just lost. But then we gather around your table and we think about the cross on the hill outside the gate and we remember that all of that was clean by the blood of of the Lamb. And as we stand in awe this morning, that you would desire to clean us, that you have the power and ability to clean us. God, I pray, let your spirit draw our hearts and minds to you. Let us know that we have a restart, a refresh, a renewal. And Jesus Christ, let us be reminded that we have redemption in your blood. Let us take this moment to remember, to proclaim your death until you come again. We are, Jesus Christ, eternally thankful for the cross on the hill outside the gate. In your name, Lord. Amen. Amen.
executive director of FAME. FAME is bringing help and hope to the world through medical evangelism. to say that the most bifurcated sermon topic in all of Christendom is the topic of giving. Right? Some preachers had told me, I preach on giving twice a year. One minister told us that he preaches all January on giving. I feel bad for his church because this week there's five weeks in January so they're not just getting four, they're getting five. All January. I had another minister tell me I've been preaching for 33 years and I've never preached on the topic once. It seems like a conflict of interest for the guy who draws his salary out of the offering plate to say put more money in the offering plate instead. But the most interesting conversation I had about it was a gentleman who told me I always would preach, oh, maybe every 18 months or so on giving. And as the demographics have changed around my church, we have a lot of millennials now that attend. People in their 20s. We have a lot of millennials that attend. And he said they get visibly agitated when I talk about giving or serving. And he said, so I've pulled back on it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to be told to give. They don't want to be paid to serve. And then he looked around. And I could tell he was going to say something. And I thought, is he going to cuss or something? What's he looking around for? He looked around. And he looked over at me and he whispered. He said, you know they call millennial snowflakes, don't you? I busted out laughing. I said, yeah, I know they call millennial snowflakes. I call millennial snowflakes. What are you talking about? I said, but I've got some counterexamples. Now, up here before, I used Brandon Golden as an example because he plays on Sunday morning and he plays on Sunday night with the Hispanic service, but if you use somebody as an example twice, they get egotistical. So I'm not going to mention Brandon today. I go in a different direction. 
There was somebody up here singing today, Kayla Allen, young lady standing, I don't know, right there. Boy, she must be short. Look at this. The young lady was standing right about here. Okay, somebody comes over to the other. That wasn't a good idea, was it? <laughs> you know, you have to practice on Wednesday night, and you got to practice on Sunday morning, and you sing two services on Sunday morning. Kayla's a millennial. I remember Kayla will always kind of have a special place because she was the first person that Tina baptized. Not the last person that he baptized, but the first person. And there's a picture, little Kayla with her bangs down in Tina's office. Remember the bang face? Of Kayla with her bangs down in the office, her and Tina stand right about here, smiling after the baptism. It was a beautiful thing. Amen. Amen. It was a beautiful thing. Kayla goes off to college, she gets a couple of big shot degrees, she comes back to her home church. Me and Tina are getting old, so Tina takes that baton and she hands it out, and Kayla leans back and she grabs it. And she's serving, don't get the big head, and she's serving as a millennial. In her church. I also told the guy about somebody else, Fatima Torres. When the pandemic started, Fatima was already doing like 80 things at the church. She runs half the youth ministry for us, she runs half the Hispanic ministry for Lalo and Isela. She sings on Sunday nights, she sings on Wednesday nights, she did G for us on Wednesday night, on and on it goes. When the pandemic started, Fatima's heart was touched. We had these middle school girls, and y'all know what a mess middle school. Back to Kayla with the bass. <laughs> you don't want to miss that one. And even more so this year, we had some fifth graders, Valeria and Abel, that were going from fifth to sixth grade. And so the team was starting an online Bible study. As far as I know, it's still going. She started an online Bible study with these kids to keep them connected to each other, to keep them connected to the church, all while she's working a full-time job, all while she's doing other things at the church, all while she's trying to go to college to get a degree. So I said to him, I get it. I get the snowflake thing. But I've got examples in just my little church of 20-somethings that do understand, that do serve. And I said, here's what I think about some of the young people in my church. I think they want to know what the Bible says about serving and giving and loving your neighbor and reading the scriptures and praying. I think they want to know what the Bible says. And he said to me, you know what? You're right. If someone gets agitated because I tell them you should join a class, you should serve in some way, you should, if they get agitated, he says, I agree. If someone has truly understood that they're a child of God, that they've been brought, literally plucked out of the darkness and put into the light, desperate, chaotic, merciless darkness, into the glorious light of Jesus Christ, they want to know what the Bible says. Who am I now? You told me I'm a new creation. Who am I? What does that new creation look like? What does God say to that new creation? I want to understand that. He got all worked up. He basically started preaching to me. I just sat there and listened, which is not my spiritual gift, by the way. <laughs> Generally, I talk and you listen. That's my spiritual gift. I just sat there and listened. And then finally, he says, we're preaching about giving the first Sunday. I said, we are? Yes. We are. I'm doing it. You're doing it. We're preaching about giving because you know what? If somebody really understands the utter darkness and somebody's really been brought into glorious, cleansing, beautiful, warm light, they want to know what God says. So I'm going to tell you this morning what God says. Do we give? Why do we give? When do we give? What are the benefits? We're going to talk about all of that. I may not preach on this again for 10 years. I made a deal with my buddy. If I wasn't bragging on Kayla and Fatima, I wouldn't have to do this, but it is what it is. Let me check a box here first before we get into the verses and just say a couple things. Number one, if you're worried about the conflict of interest, I can tell you I do not get a cut of the tech. So if offering goes up by 50%, my pay goes up not at all. If offering goes up 300%, Barry's pay goes up not at all. So it's not a conflict of interest, I promise. If you're concerned about that, 
I don't have a problem. Don't give to this church. The kingdom is wide and broad and beautiful. Now, some ministers will tell you they think you should give to your local church, or even some say the first 10% should go to the local church. A lot of Christians believe that, and I'm not going to sit down and argue with them. I'll just say this. If you're not comfortable, don't give here. You saw the video on the phone. Those guys are amazing. Barry and I actually had lunch with Bill Warren, the director, the guy with the beard. I remember it well. I had lime cilantro shrimp tacos. Outstanding. Outstanding. I don't remember what Bill talked about, but I do remember the lime cilantro <laughs> shrimp tacos. Them jokers were good. And I mean, Bill's sitting there just pouring his heart out about the things that they do. <clears throat> Operations in Africa. And, I mean, it's, it's insane. The Caribbean and South America. They go and work with local churches or local missionaries. They send medical personnel into these places to do things that just can't be done locally. We got a capital fund. If you don't want to put it in the general office because you're afraid I'm going to get my greedy hands on it, put it in the capital fund. Allow us to improve our building, to expand it, to enhance it. If you want to give, there's different ways you can do it. Go to the ATM, grab some cash, throw it the plate, you can write a check. You can go online to your bill pay. And just like you would send a check to, almost said singular wireless. Wow, how long ago was that? Send a check to Verizon. You can go into your bill pay and say, send a check to First Christian Maitland and make it this amount. It's recurring or it's not recurring or whatever you want to do. Or we are so technologically advanced that you can actually download an app. Now, you can. I can. For those of you who know, I'm cell phone challenged. I have a Galaxy Mini 3, which was probably born during the Bang era. And I tried to download an app about five years ago on it, and it said to me, this operating system is no longer supported. Update your system, exclamation point. I said, how about I just throw the phone away? Don't worry about it. So I can't download an app, but in theory, you can go to your app store, Android or Apple, and download the tile of the app. There'll be a blue one and a green one. You download the green one. You go in there and you look for First Christian Church of Mapleton, and you can give that way. It's easy to give. But let's look at the scriptures. The why, the what, the where, the when, the how. We'll do Old Testament first and the New Testament. Numbers 18. Moses has led the Hebrew nation out of bondage across the Red Sea. They're now free from enslavement. Brought out by the hand, the miracle, powerful hand of God. And one of the things Moses says to them is this. To the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance. Here we go. Why? In return for the service that they do, their service in the tent of meeting. We don't have a tent of meeting anymore. We don't have a Levitical priest. Today we would say this. I have given every tithe in the New Testament Christian church to those preachers and ministers and staff that do the work of the service in God's church. Thankfully, we don't meet in a tent in the desert anymore. But there are still people who do service in God's church. We're open 24-7. Always will be. Second Chronicles. Still Old Testament. And he commanded the people who lived in Jerusalem to give the portion due to priests and the Levites. So again, this is the portion is tithe he's talking about, and he's giving it to basically the people that work in the church. Why? Why did you ask? That they might give themselves to the law of the Lord. As soon as the command was spread abroad, the people of Israel gave in abundance the first fruits of grain, wine, oil, honey, and all the produce of the field. And they brought in abundantly the tithe of everything. And the people of Israel and Judah who lived in the cities of Judah also brought in the tithe of cattle and sheep and the tithe of the dedicated things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God and laid them in heaps. God said, remember 
what I told you back in Numbers? That I was going to create a dedicated body of people that were going to serve me in the church. And I gave land to all the other tribes, but I didn't give land to those people because you know what? I'm not asking them to farm or to be shepherds or to be fishermen. I'm asking them to work in the kingdom. Right? I don't want, Andy doesn't want Bill Warren. That's right, he's talking to you. Andy doesn't want Bill Warren having to go work as an insurance agent five days a week and then go and run fame as an international mission on his leftover days. I want Bill Warren dedicated to work in fame every hour of every day. Because he is literally, his organization is literally servicing millions of people a year. I don't want CY Kim. Some of you know CY and Patricia. They come <coughs> and hang out with us. Patricia sits in the amen corner. I told her every time she's here, I preach long because when she starts amen and I get fired up, we start feeding off each other. She said we apologize to all you guys for that. <laughs> Patricia and CY's organization is in dozens of countries. They work in leper colonies. Are you kidding me? They feed orphans in Southeast Asia. They run the bakeries to make the bread to feed the orphans in Southeast Asia. I don't want CY Kim to have to work a full-time job at Verizon Wireless and spend his leftover time. No, I want CY Kim busting it for the kingdom. How's he going to do that? Because the people are going to bring and what does it say when God reminded them that I want this done so that they might give themselves to the law of the Lord? It said they brought it and they heaped it up. <clears throat> okay, we get it. We see what Bill Warren does. We see what Seymour Kim does. We know what Chris Garcia does. Heap it up. You say, yeah, but dude, that was Old Testament. We don't have a biblical priest and we don't have tents and we don't have temples. Check. New Testament, nice try. New Testament, 1 Corinthians 9. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service give their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. That's the same exact same thing I just said. Don't make preachers, don't make evangelists, don't make missionary guys work full-time jobs. Now, some of us do. There are a lot of bivocational preachers out there. And sometimes when a church is in bad financial shape, the minister is glad to work another job and be able to preach when he can and evangelize the community when he can. But it's not actually the design. The design is for full-time ministers and church staff. Paul understanding human nature, or I should say Paul being human himself, Paul understanding human nature knew that we can have good intentions with not so good results. So Paul writes this, same church, to the church at Corinth, his first letter, Paul tells them how to overcome that good intentions, bad results. Now concerning the collection for the saints, <clears throat> as I directed the churches of Galatia, so are <clears throat> you also, so also are you to do. On the first day of every week, every Sunday, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. That's important. So that there will be no collecting when I come. Don't have good intentions. Don't think about it. Don't talk about it. Don't pray about it. Just every Sunday, do it. Just every Sunday, just do it. I want to pause and say here, it's not the amount, guys. I promise you, it's not the amount. And human nature says, well, that's not true. If we want to buy a car, it is the amount. Everybody in the family pitch in, we're going to buy a car. Well, I gave a dollar, and you gave two, and you gave three. Ain't get much of a car for that, right? In human terms, in earthly terms, it's really only the amount that counts, right? Well, we have nine people in the family, only one person gave money, but they put 30,000 in, so we got a nice car. 
That's not how it works in the kingdom. And so don't let yourself think that the amount matters. You know what? God's pretty bright. And God knows that you're making 250000 unmarried. And God knows that this is a single mom with two kids working fast food. Don't you think God can do those calculations? What does the psalm say? God owns everything, all the cattle on every hill, all the stars in the sky, all the planets, the people, the animals. God owns it all. I promise you the amount doesn't matter to him. Walk in somebody's house at Christmas. Beautiful tree, all decorated. And if you look, there's usually some really nice ornaments that somebody gave. Maybe as a wedding gift or an anniversary gift or an older child gave. It's gold or it's crystal. And they always seem to be hanging on the back of the tree. And on the front of the tree are these disjointed, miscolored things made out of broken popsicle sticks. Right? And you're thinking to yourself, no, that's ugly. And mama's thinking, my baby made that for me. Right? We got parents with young kids here. Right? Some of you know Eden Davis. I love Eden. He's about this tall and his personality is about this big. I guarantee you, if I give Ashley Davis a $2,000 ornament and Eden cracks a popsicle stick, paints an orange, and hands it to Mama with a smile on his face, the broken popsicle sticks go on the front. Shane and Mauricio just had a baby. And when that little baby's old enough to give Shana his first homemade Christmas ornament, let me tell you something. Mama will hold it until she dies. You know how I know? Because <clears throat> sitting on the table over there at my mother-in-law's house is the tackiest napkin holder I've ever seen in my life. <coughs> Elizabeth and Tina are flinching. <laughs> it's a little wooden thing. It was polished or shellac or something. And Bo Smith, as some of you know, who must be left-handed, and he must have been having an asthma attack, he cut out these flowers from some magazine and sloppily pasted it on the top of that napkin. Tackiest thing I've ever seen in my life. No offense, Sarah. And that thing has sat in the middle of that table the whole 31 years I've been around that family. And every napkin I've ever got out of there, I had to pull out a precious bones napkin. Because her baby gave that to her. Right? And you know what? You're God's baby. You're God's child. So I'm telling you, Tina could walk in with a solid gold napkin holder that weighed so much she and I had to carry it in together. Plop it down on the table. Sarah would politely, or not so much, scoot it out of the way. And bring tacky mania back and sit right in the middle of the table and put the napkins in. I'm telling you, that single mom with two kids, when she puts a dollar and 37 cents in the plate, God is dancing the dance. Not because a dollar 37 can buy anything, but because God says, man, I know your resources are precious to you. For some people, money's not that precious. Their time is precious. I run my own business. I work six and a half days a week. I travel all God says, right, but I want some of that time. That's how you're going to sacrificially give to me. That's your offer. Give me your time. Some people say, I got all the time in the world because I can only find a part-time job. And God goes, yeah, I know. And I want you $1.37. I'm going to hang it right in the front middle of the tree. And all the hundred thousand dollar gifts, they're going in the back. Because I don't actually need money. I'm God. I need it. I'll create it. God doesn't have wants. And God doesn't have needs. But God has a heart. God has a heart. And anybody's heart can be touched. 
on their baby gives them something. But you say, well, what does the Bible say about giving? I want to understand all the scripture says. The scripture actually, to me, implies that there are blessings to giving. Let me read you a verse, Proverbs 3. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. Now remember, Proverbs is not some kind of prophetical scripture. It's not to be taken literally. Proverbs and, and uh, Solomon writes this in Proverbs chapter 1. I'm writing all this down, Solomon says, because it's just good, sound advice. It all has the stamp of God on it. But it's really just good, sound, common sense advice. If you read the writings of Buddha and you read the writings of Solomon in Proverbs, there's an awful lot of overlap. Because Buddha said, I lived a long time. I've been rich and I've been poor. And here's what I've learned. Solomon said, I lived a long time. I've been rich. And this is what I've learned. But Solomon writes it as common sense. So I'm not guaranteeing you that if you put a dollar thirty-seven in the plate, that your vats will burst with wine. In fact, I doubt any of you even have a vat in the basement, to be honest. A vat, maybe, but not a vat. <laughs> but I do think that verse speaks to the idea of physical blessings, maybe even financial blessings. I've never spoken to anyone who said. I ended up giving a dollar too much to my church, and now I lost my car, my house, my whatever. Acts 20. Paul says, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. I don't think that's speaking there about physical or financial blessings. I think that's speaking of mental, emotional type blessings. When you give, when you serve, there is a good feeling that comes back in there. Maybe that's not the reason we do it, but the Bible seems to pretty clearly state that's the benefit of it. Right? Paul could have said, you know Jesus himself said, give because God said so in the story. Give because God expects it. And if he said, no, give because it's more blessed to give than receive anyway. You will feel good. There are positive. Now, here's the thing. Our mind tells us that's not true. The human mind says over and over and over, be selfish, be greedy, poor. You'll be happier the more you focus on you. But experience tells us that's not true. Experience says, when I give and when I help, I feel better. So maybe there's some physical blessings. Maybe there's some emotional, mental blessings. One more. Paul's second letter to the church at Corinth. They were a mess, so they had to get two letters. The point is this, he says. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give. Here we go. Listen, listen, listen. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. How much should I give, Andy? I'm not going to tell you. I think you should give as you've decided in your heart, because God loves a cheerful giver. Imagine mama standing up, make me an ornament. Make it, make it from popsicle sticks. Make it look ridiculous. Paint it orange. Whines and moans and fusses about it and finally says, just to shut mom up and throw some popsicle sticks together, glues them on the hot gun, burns half the house down in the process, paints it orange and gives it to mom. Really? Is she going to hang out on the tree and feel a sense of joy every time she sees it? God ain't going to force you to give. I ain't going to force you to give. I'm not going to tell you how much to give. I'll tell you the amount of that. God loves a cheerful yeah, but God is a father. God is a father. And when a father's children voluntarily say, I love you so much and I know what you do and my heart belongs to you and I ain't got much. Oh, man, does that light your daddy up. Let me close out with a couple of points here. We read this morning in our scripture reading, Psalm 96, 
Verse 8, ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name and bring an offering and come into his courts. I was with a preacher once and somebody asked him, and he used the word absolutely, which I thought was interesting. He said, do I absolutely have to give money to the church to go to heaven? Preacher had a pen in his hand. He kept toiling the pen. He never looked up. I'm thinking, I'm glad he asked him that question and not me. Do I absolutely have to give to go to heaven? Preacher said, I don't like the way you phrase that question. Cool as a cucumber. I don't like the way you phrase that question, he said. Let me ask you a different question. Are you sure you're a Christian if you don't want to give? Boom. If I had a mic, I'd drop it and make very mad. <laughs> we're not to blow into the mic, we're not to tap the mics, and we're not to drop the mics for effect. That's the only thing I've learned. <laughs> oh, and don't twist the cords up. So I'm sorry I said nice things about you, Kevin, but you're going down on me tonight, so <laughs> Here's the truth, guys. There are certain things in the scriptures that the New Testament writers just assume. Any do I have to to go to heaven question? Do I have to pray to go to heaven? Do I have to read the Bible to go to heaven? Do I have to give to go to heaven? Do I have to be baptized to go to heaven? Every one of those questions, I like that preacher's turn it around. Well, are you really a Christian if you don't want to talk to God in prayer? Are you really a Christian if you don't want to hear from God in his word? Are you really a Christian if you have no desire to be baptized? When do you think you became a Christian? Well, I think I became a Christian in 1971. And you've not been baptized, no. And you've never said, no, man. I like that preacher's, maybe we didn't need to talk. I ain't never known somebody who's been hooked by the Holy Spirit that couldn't wait to dive head first into that water. I've never known anybody who's been hooked by the gospel message that didn't start praying, that didn't ask a preacher, tell me what the Bible says about who I'm supposed to be. Psalm 96 says, bring an offering and come into his courts. Here's my question. How do you not? How do you not bring an offering and come into God's presence? You say, well, it would be a sacrifice to put a dollar thirty-seven in the plate. Okay, let's play a game. You're going to look at a man, half naked, beaten until the meat came off his back and you could see his ribs. Riding in agony, losing fluid, which means his heart was pounding for hours. And he's up there, and when you lose fluid, your muscles start to cramp. And so he is riding around. That's what people did on the cross. They tried to find any position where they could stop the cramps, and they're all over their body as their heart pounds. You're going to look at that guy and say, wait, you actually think I should sacrifice for you? Is that what this religion is about? You don't look at a guy hanging on the cross and ask him if you're supposed to sacrifice, do you? How do you come into God's house? Again, guys, I'm not worried about if you give it to FCCM or if you call CY Kim tonight and say, my soul's been touched and I'm about to start funding your ministry in Asia. Send it to Asia. I don't need your money. God don't need your money. But how can you come into God's courts and not throw a dollar thirty-seven in the plate? Do it and see if the blessings I mentioned don't start. See if you don't start feeling a little bit better. Maybe there's even some blessings, whatever the Bible means by that. Maybe there's blessings I get. Maybe I do feel. A little bit better. Maybe spiritually I get a little kick. Yeah. Christianity is about sacrifice. 
Christ. Ain't no question about it. You know what the worst kind of leader in the world is? Tell you one thing and they do another. You know what the kind of leader is that people will follow to their death? A leader that says, I want you to sacrifice this much, so I'm going to set the example by sacrificing this much. That's our leader. How do you come before that leader without your dollar thirty-seven in your hand? How do you come before our leader without that dollar thirty-seven in your hand? If you want to know what the Bible says about giving, that's what it says. Give so that kingdom workers can work the kingdom nonstop. Give because if fame is going to provide a medical bed and surgical equipment, it's got to be bought somewhere by some dollar. Give that dollar to buy that equipment. If C.Y. Kim is going to go show love to people with leprosy, he sits down and eats with them. Buy his plane ticket to send him over there. Again, the biblical writers assume when they write about baptism, they don't say, hey, you Christians, those of us who's chosen to be baptized, they don't know they say, all of us who have been baptized into Christ. Jesus didn't say, if you decide to pray, I want you to come. No, no. When you pray, pray this way. The writers assume you're being baptized, you're praying, you're giving, you're serving, and you're looking at God's word. The, the writers of the Bible just assume that. Amy, do I absolutely have to give? Wrong question. Wrong question. You may get the opportunity to give. You may get the opportunity to speak to the creator of the universe. You may get the opportunity to hear from the creator of the universe. And you may get an opportunity to do service and work with the creator of the universe. I don't know what you absolutely have to do. Tell me what your heart wants to do. Let me pray. God, our desire is to come into your presence and bring an offering. And for each one, that looks different. For some, it might be an offering of praise. Singing in public may be very uncomfortable for them. And for them to sing to you in a corporate setting would be the ornament you would put in the front of that tree. Maybe it's raising their hand when they sing. They feel that urge inside to lift that hand to the glory of God the Father, but they can't. There's only one or two other people doing it. And maybe for them, for some, it's an offering of raising that hand as they sing to you as just a sign of surrender to the King. And that's the one which you put on the front of their Christmas tree. Maybe for some very busy, stressed out people, it's time. Maybe they're going to make time on Thursdays to come and work with Rose and Pam and Mary and Sweetwater and Kristen and serve this community because time is their most precious thing. But in America, Father, I think we all think money is our most precious resource. And so my prayer is, Father, bless those in this congregation. Bless them financially. And bless those, God, who give to you. I pray, bless those who give to you. But more importantly, Father, I pray, bless what is collected as it is deployed into your kingdom. Give the leaders of this church the wisdom and the courage to allocate those resources as you would like them allocated. And then I pray, God, take every dollar and bless it to have a $10,000 impact because only you can do that. I pray, God, that your spirit takes the meager little things, takes our dollar thirty-seven, and changes a life, which then grabs the baton and changes another life, which then grabs the baton and changes another life still. God, when we give, and we give with joy in our hearts, bless us and bless our offering that our work can glorify the eternal God.
God of creation. Father, go with everybody in this room in 2021. We pray, we pray that 2021 is better than 2020. God, I pray for every person listening to my voice that you bless their life, that you give them peace, that you help them work through their troubles. Father, if there are those who are having financial issues, I pray that you bless them. I know we have those with medical needs this morning. Paula and Susan and Josh and Sherry and Lamb. Father, we lift those people up. I pray bless the FCCM congregation this year. Let it be our best and productive year serving our Father and our King. Jesus, we give you honor, glory, and praise because we know you were raised to redeem us and renew us and restart us. And for that, we will always worship you. Praise, honor, power, and glory to you, Jesus the Christ. In your name, amen. Amen. Amen, amen. You're sitting in the back of this, let me